I'm Mark Zauer, uh, and I'm just going to introduce Anders and let say as little as possible and explain how we're going to proceed. So, very brief introductions uh, uh, so that uh, we can hear from the panelists. Adam is uh, Catherine Ojobi Colin Davis, Professor of, of History, and he will be known to many of you for his um, very important work on the Nazi war economy. Before that, the first book was uh, a surprisingly interesting uh, monograph <laughs> on German statistics in the early 20th century. Really interesting. Um, I, I like to think carrying on the tradition, uh, the tenuous tradition uh, of the late lamented Alan Millward, who was his supervisor, uh, and bringing economic history, which had almost died in this country, into the new era. So uh, I think I speak for everybody here and say we think we're really lucky to have you with us, uh, and um, we're looking forward to this uh, discussion. So, so Adam is going to kick off with five or ten minutes on the book, and then we have three wonderful panelists uh, who represent a dizzying array of cross-disciplinary perspectives. Uh, the first is Katarina Pistol, who's the Michael Southern Professor of Law at the Columbia Law School, um, and who, whose work, I don't want to summarize her, her, her work, but it explores, I guess, the, the relationship between finance and, and law across different kinds of property regimes over time, very different kinds of property regimes. Uh, and is hence, uh, for, for me, one of the most interesting bodies of work that we have at the moment on the mutations of modern capitalism. So Katerina will go next. And then we have Charles Sable, uh, who started off with a PhD uh, in government from Harvard, uh, which is a little bit like saying you have a, a, an undergraduate degree in classics from Oxford. It means you could go in almost any direction. And, and, uh, and so I think his, his work is very extraordinary. Uh, range from early, early work in the social sciences uh, when he was at MIT through to serving here initially in the political science, well, political science at MIT and then coming here as Morris Moore Professor of Law at Columbia Law School. He will go next. He will also speak for five, ten minutes. And then our third panelist is Tano Santos, uh, who originally did his work at the University of Madrid, a PhD in economics from the University of Chicago worked in the field of asset pricing, and he's uh, David and LCM Dog Professor of Finance at the Columbia Business School. They will each speak for between five and ten minutes in response to Adam and giving their thoughts about the book. Uh, Adam will then respond to those thoughts, and then we will open it up for the general discussion. So, Adam, well, um, first of all, though, thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, thank you to all of you for coming. I mean, if uh, <laughs> you feel lucky, imagine how I feel this evening. Um, it, Mark uh, was instrumental, uh, the moving force in bringing me to Columbia, and I'm extremely grateful for him for doing that, because it's been a, an extraordinary community for, for doing this work, for finishing this book, which I started as a course teaching at Yale. And uh, I really couldn't uh, imagine a better panel than the panel I have here this evening. Uh, it's really... Uh, and I don't think in the reception of the book I will probably have a panel I'm more curious to hear the opinions of. Um, so I, I'm really, I feel deeply privileged uh, to have this opportunity to discuss the book with you this evening. It's really a, a great, it's a great uh, privilege. Um, uh, so I'm going to be as brief as I can because I really want to hear what you have to say and then I can, I can respond off the back of that and look forward to taking questions from, from all of you. Um, let me say, I guess, uh, th three things about the book. Um, you can think of them as sort of disciplinary uh, uh, things, different, three different angles. Uh, Mark was commenting on the multidisciplinary quality of this panel. Didn't you have an Oxford degree in classics? <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, I didn't have a, I didn't have a degree in history. I had my my first degree is in economics. Um, so things have gone kind of uh, sideways since then. Um, I think there's three different ways of looking at this book. One is that it one is that it's a it's a it's a piece of uh, global global history in which the challenge really of writing the book uh, was to knit together uh, narratives uh, from all over the world and to assemble them into something like a coherent uh, picture 
uh, and, to, and to, to assemble them as a story, so to assemble them as a narrative uh, that, that uh, followed a dynamic storyline, um, which did justice to the complexity of an event that was truly global and that I was determined to show as global, um, that placed uh, at the heart of the story, not the story of uh, the US economy alone or the European economy in the Eurozone crisis after 2010, uh, but, but focused squarely on the centrality of the transatlantic axis as the core of this crisis. Um, and then around that wove a variety of different stories about uh, Russia, uh, China, uh, the emerging markets as a sort of uh, backdrop to that narrative. Um, and that, that was one challenge in writing the book. Uh, and it was a challenge that I took on um, in part because uh, it was a challenge I'd already addressed in other history books uh, related to transatlantic economic relations, uh, most explicitly in the last book I did, uh, Deluge, uh, on uh, the reconfiguration of world power in World War I and its aftermath, which is a story really about how the rise of the United States transformed power relations around the world, uh, also implicitly in the, the, the wages of destruction. So that was one element of the task in writing this book, was to continue that narrative of transatlantic relations centered on financial interrelations and how they and how they how they affected the wider world um, and and the key one of the key as it were discoveries one of the key remappings that the book performs it's not my discovery by any means and I'll come on to that in just a second but one of the arguments that the book is making um, is that to understand financial globalization in the early 21st century we still, perhaps somewhat surprisingly, have to focus on the old Atlantic axis which goes back at least to the 18th century uh, and became and took on its distinctively modern form uh, around World War I and then its latest and updated form in the 1960s in the form of the euro dollar market. And that this somewhat at odds with, I think, the narrative of globalization that we had that dominated particularly in the US in the early 2000s was not, therefore, first and foremost, a Sino-American story, but a Euro-American story. Um, and and the, this was uh, strangely absent, in fact, from, I think, from wider consciousness. At the time of the crisis, less so, but in the aftermath and then the retelling, I think it became, as it were, two separate narratives that did not connect. And my mission in writing the book, uh, and that really has been my primary purpose in writing the book, has to uh, been to put that relationship squarely back at the centre of the story, which I think is something that both Americans and Europeans need to hear. They needed to hear it when I started writing the book. They perhaps needed to hear it even more today. So that was, that was, that was one. Tell a story of the crisis as a transatlantic story with a global dimension. Um, that was the historian's uh, challenge. But to do that, um, I found, uh, to my surprise, increasing fascination and delight, that there was in fact a very interesting story to tell about the development of economics as well. Sorry, this mic keeps going in and out. Um, and, and that's a story about the fragmentation in the face of the crisis of familiar ways of thinking about international economics. Uh, ways of thinking about the uh, international economics which I had traced in my first book back to the early 20th century, the aftermath of World War I, and the development in that period of what we came to know as national macroeconomics. So the accounting framework that we identify with the name of Keynes and that is solidified in things like national income accounting, current account statistics and so on. And those were in fact essentially unhelpful in understanding what was happening in 2008. And what was dramatic and fascinating um, is that, in fact, almost exactly as the crisis began, a new brand of economics emerged, uh, which is called macrofinancial economics, which breaks through the familiar assumptions about national economies and substitutes for them a focus on the balance sheets of the biggest banks. It's as though capitalism caught up with economics. Um, what critics of globalization have been saying since the 1970s, which is that big corporations and their interactions dominate the world economy, was emphatically true. Nothing could demonstrate it more powerfully than the collective uh, financial heart attack of 2008. And there was a brand of economics emerging as the crisis struck to understand this. And really, the mission of the book from that point of view is to craft a narrative out of that new macro financial literature, which circulates in amongst the Cognoscenti, Perry Merling, our former colleague at Barnard, was one of the key figures in this. We worked through INET, 
uh, bank economists work on this, BIS types. And what I wanted to do in this book was to place that at the heart of the narrative and by doing so, displace, frankly, some of the existing accounts which were still framed, to my mind, anachronistically in the mode of national economics, which belonged to the mid-20th century rather than to the 21st century. And that brought me to then my third task, which is, I think, uh, you know, the one which... Um, uh, the third element of this, which is uh, my long-standing interest in social theory, political theory, and the question of power. Um, because illuminating as this new focus, not on national economies, but on corporations is, um, and powerful as it is in terms of giving us purchase on economic reality in a way that we were not able to get it by way of the sort of euphemistic abstractions of Keynesian macroeconomics, it poses an absolutely fundamental political question, which is how are capitalist democracies going to govern themselves if they frankly face the fact that power is concentrated in oligopolistic large corporations? And this, I think, is really the question of the question of the present uh, in many dimensions. We see that in you know, ongoing debates about inequality, uh, oligopoly in the tech sector, and so on. And I'll just wrap up by saying that on this third axis, this seems to me the question that I ask across a whole variety of different dimensions, that what the, question, what the crisis exposed was that in the regulation of domestic finance, uh, in the management of transatlantic finance, in the Eurozone itself, uh, and then in the relations between the West, if you like, that emerged triumphant from the Cold War and its immediate neighbours, notably Russia, the question of the political frame of economic deep, deep, deep financial integration driven necessarily by private interests was begged again and again and again and again. The question was posed, it was clearly forced by the scale of integration and yet fundamentally the question was not even posed explicitly let alone provided with an adequate answer. And we say this about the Eurozone all the time, a monetary union without a fiscal union, but you could say the same thing about the transatlantic, essentially a financial union without an economic, a political match. Uh, and we could say very much the same thing about the deep integration of Eastern Europe, massive financial absorption without a geopolitical deal with the Russians. Ironically, the only bit of the global financial system which did have a clear, explicitly formulated, supervening political frame was the relationship with China, which was the one that was expected to explode in 2007-8 and didn't. Perhaps precisely because it was always acknowledged as a geoeconomic, geopolitical problem was managed as such. So when Larry Summers quipped about the, the threat of mutually assured financial destruction or the balance of financial terror, he was kind of closer to the truth than I think he even realised, in the sense that, like MAD, like nuclear uh, balance, this was explicitly managed and turned out to be something that could take us to the edge of disaster that didn't. What did was the, was the banking crisis. So I've spoken for too long already and set a bad example. But those are the three dimensions, I think, of the book that I would highlight, and I really look forward to hearing from you. This is just fantastic panel. Thank you so much for taking the time to do this this evening. Thank you, thank you very much. Well, thank you for inviting me to both read the book and then comment on it. I, I have to say, so giving you uh, 616 pages to read and then allowing you to comment for five, five to minutes. ten minutes is <laughs> cruel and unusual punishment. <laughs> <laughs> So let me just, I will just focus in on, on four points that the book raised for me, and there are many, many others, and the book is, there's even more in there than the thickness of the book might suggest. I want to make four, um, uh, or touch upon four issues. One is, is it truly a transatlantic axis, or isn't it, it really Anglo-American at core, at its core nonetheless? Uh, the second question is, um, you know, who are the real actors? Because we find a lot of reactors in this book, but few clear actors, if any. Um, I want to ask what crashed. I'm still not clear what really crashed mm -hmm. in this book. Um, and I want to just briefly touch upon the solutions and just say, um, well, when you ask at the very end, does the law offer a solution? I said, well, no, not, 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 not the law. <laughs> For people, um, uh, clear. So the first one, um, I think you're right, it's a transatlantic axis, but at the core of the transatlantic relationship is an Anglo-Saxon, an Anglo-American apex, right? The entire book is about the hierarchy of financial systems. And I would add to that, if you think of, at it from a, about it from a legal point of view, every financial asset at every financial intermediary is coded in law. Mm -hmm. And in theory, you could actually sustain a global financial system with only a single legal system, mm -hmm. as long as all the other states recognize mm -hmm. the creatures of that legal system. And I think, in truth, we don't have one legal system that sustains global finance, but two. 
It's England, not the UK. It's English common law, and it's the laws of the state of New York. Everything else is, <laughs> is decoration around it. And that's where all, I think, where the core action is. And I think when you go back, also the euro dollar market is sort of this is where the core financial system, um, innovation happens. This is where the financial intermediaries are. And this is actually also where the 100 global law firms are in those yeah. two cities. So I think it is actually at the core Anglo American. I grant you the euro set crisis is not separate. And it's really important to make that. Um, uh, clear in the book, this, this is related, and of course the, the euro was created under assumptions almost as if we could still have capital controls. I mean, they said you can't, and they changed the treaty and said free capital flow, but they completely did not understand that they did this on the background of a system that had been completely unleashed, where you could basically mint capital in law as freely as never before. And clearly the euro's uh, institutions were much less prepared for that than even the American or the English ones, which crashed sort of two or were also challenged, to say the very least. So I would still say they sort of at the, at the very core, in the micro level, institutions, it's all um, the common law, essentially. Um, where are the actors? Um, you know, even if you think about core and periphery, we talk about Bernanke um, a lot in Draghi, and you see the key actors at the central banks doing stuff. Even Malcolm, mm -hmm. one of the protagonists, is exercising veto power. It's yeah. always veto power. Nobody acts. It's everybody, than, yeah. everybody reacts. And it's at some level, I think we have to. This is also. I mean, you, you say this in power um, discussion is the oligopolis um, um, of corporate um, of big corporations and big banks, etc. And and yet one still wonders whether one couldn't um, be sort of more more, more precise um, about this. And I think you know we can't really dispense of the state either. If I'm right, it's all about the law. Then the law is sponsored by states. It doesn't exist without that. And for me, one of the most remarkable things is that after the crisis, when the financial system crashed, the state-sponsored financial global financial system crashed, nobody made a serious attempt to regain control over that system, yeah. even though it's code in the law. We seem yeah. to have the means, but we yeah. seem not to be able to to um, exercise them. So, so that, I think, is one of the most remarkable puzzles. And in a way, because you tell the story like a political story of the 19th century, so all the state actors that mm. you recount, you just one gets sort of so confused at some points as well. But they are all bystanders. At some level, they are ironically all bystanders. Mm. And um, I just want to make that, you know, to just push that a little bit further. Just um, also, I, actually, I, I should say at the beginning, I thought at some point, why don't you tell the story from the perspective of the assets or the financial intermediary? Why are we still talking mm. about these political players? Because they play such a bystander role. Then my question, of course, is what crashed? And the financial system didn't really crash because we rescued it from the abyss. Well, it didn't crash. Um, what crashed, seems to me, um, is a particular compromise of the liberal left um, that you can have. That you can have it all. You can have wealth and richness, and you can satisfy the poorer people by just putting them on the um, credit dependence. Right? So that is basically what uh, what crashed. We don't have to redistribute. We don't have to fight the political um, fights to redistribute. We can simply make sure that they have all access to credit. And mm -hmm. that notion, of course, is crazy. Miss, we could have told us um, that earlier. Um, and I think, um, again, so what we do now is so if we basically pump liquidity in the system. We're just basically saying state money to mm -hmm. rescue the private um, credit production from its own um, follies. Here again, I think so the state is actually up front um, um, and, and center. And the interesting thing is, is, is that it sort of fulfills these roles um, all, all, all the time. And here's one tension I find in the in the book. I mean, you, you I think in a way you correctly criticize Merkel that it, um, you know, she vetoed everything that would have had that effect pumping the credit in the system. But that is, to me, the quintessential technocratic solution to the technocratic system that you also criticize, because it misses the democratic politics. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then lastly, just a, a point on the, um, on, on, on the solutions. You know, I, when I say so it's, you know, the entire system is constructed in law, then of course law must be the solution, but law must be the solution in a very different way, right? Because all the MBSs, CMOs, CBOs, CBSs, repos, swaps, the rehypothesization of all these instruments, the marginal calls, the, everything is coded in law. And every decent lawyer in the city of New York or London will tell you that any public financial regulation that you put in place to tame the beast, they will mute. They will, they, they will mute it. They will just get around it. Right, yeah. With the classic instruments of private law. It's not the public law in which this is all coded. So 
you know, when, when, I, when we don't think about it's all the solution, well, it's going to be really, really difficult to make the solution. It's certainly, unless you go to the root causes, I don't think mm -hmm. you can catch it. But it was a great week. I really enjoyed it very much. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. I, you know, so, um, so I also spent uh, a feverish week <laughs> and reading my notes, and it's, a, it's an amazing, it's an amazing achievement. This one, Adam, and it's uh, the best book I've read about the crisis, and I've read many of them for my many scenes. So I was talking with Charles right before, right before the, uh, uh, the talk, and he was asking me. Uh, you know what I was going to say. I thought this is exactly. You know, I told him. I said, "Well, this is completely at odds with what Adam thinks." You know, so I didn't know that we potentially may have a disagreement. So let me take a, let me take it on, and, yeah. uh, and uh, let's see whether we can we can agree. So I also pick up. Could you speak closer? Yeah, I also pick up on this issue of the transatlantic nature uh, of the crisis, and I will have something to say about this in a moment because this is something that surprised me uh, greatly from the very beginning of the crisis. And the reason is because uh, I had a very personal experience that I want to relate to you because it's something that comes up in uh, Adam's book that is quite uh, original, I think, and that it comes from his uh, close reading of the work that is being done in the BIS right now and trying to understand uh, what is going on in the world financial system. In 2008-2009, I, I had a sabbatical and I was at the New York Fed and uh, you know, I was a fly on the wall. Uh, the world was sinking, so but I was there spending some time with the economists at the New York Fed. And from time to time, they would organize uh, meetings to tell us about the different liquidity facilities that were being put in place by the New York Fed, by the Federal Reserve, in order to actually meet uh, different stages of the crisis. And one day, uh, they gave us a lecture on the term option facility, uh, TAF, which was uh, one of the earliest efforts by the Federal Reserve to promptly put it into the market in 2007. Yeah. And there was an option already of liquidity in December of 2007. And there's a workshop, I don't know when, in 2008 or perhaps early 2009, where someone tells us what happened with those options that were being conducted uh, through TAF. And, you know, this very fine economist is giving us a lecture of how the facility works. And all of a sudden, there's a slide. And there's a stunned silence in the room. And someone asks meekly, are we supposed to know this? And someone in the back of the room, uh, who I won't name, said, well, you're not supposed to know this, and you shouldn't get out of this room. And what it was, and now it can be said because it's now public, is that uh, the people who were borrowing uh, actively from tough facilities were, to a large extent, foreign banks, including German banks, uh, who had a lot of dollar exposure, and they were borrowing uh, through the Federal Reserve in order to finance their mortgage-backed securities positions in the United States. Mm -hmm. So I'm not so sure that it was purely an Anglo-Saxon thing. You know, there were some 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 strange things going on with European uh, with European banks at large. Now I want to explore a little bit the issue of uh, of the crisis because I think there's commonalities here uh, that need to be explored. All financial crises follow very similar patterns. So there's uh, you know they all start with severe liquidity uh, issues, uh, when all of a sudden you know, we are concerned uh, about the quality of the assets that are being dumped in the market. What characterizes all financial crises is what economists refer to as adverse selection, the fact that we do not know when buying an asset whether it's a high or low quality. And that leads to problems where the buyers simply abstain from participating mm -hmm. in the market. Liquidity dries up, and if we don't have, we have stale prices, all of a sudden we cannot assess the financial position of anyone uh, uh, in the market. So uh, this problem uh, you know, is typically addressed uh, by central banks by basically pumping the group into the system. Okay, by following the old prescription, we're going to let against group go out. And that also applies what is very scarce in a crisis, which is time. The asset that is very short supply in a crisis is time to react. And having your own central bank pumping liquidity and financing everyone uh, is very helpful. And that is the first difference with the Eurozone crisis. So that's why the Federal Reserve creates the term option facility, have the primary credit mm -hmm. facility, you name it. One after the other trying to pump it into the market. But the crisis turns when we start addressing solvency issues, which in the United States happens when we actually essentially nationalize Penny and Freddy, um, Penny and Freddy in August of 2008 with a capital purchase program. 
essentially the taxpayer has to come in and provide assurances that we're going to exclude the left-hand side parallel of the distribution process. Uh, we're going to avoid the losses being excluded. Now, this can happen in the United States. The United States was very effective at solving the biggest financial crisis. Because if you think about it, there was a very good understanding between the Federal Reserve and the Treasury on how to tackle the crisis. Now, this is precisely what distinguishes uh, the European, the American response to the European response. And it, 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 I think it's important to understand this issue, to understand the comings and goings of the Eurozone crisis. The reason why we couldn't do this in the Eurozone crisis is because Basically, liquidity provision rests with the European Central Bank, but knowledge of the solvency issues rests with the national authorities, in particular with the national central banks. So from the very beginning, there was a very severe agency issue in the Eurozone, whereas that was not the case in the US. So how do we address this issue in the Eurozone? Essentially by putting a bunch of countries into programs. So we put first, uh, I don't remember the order, Ireland, Portugal, and Greece, and later Spain, we put them into other programs. So now the Europeans can take a look into the balance sheet mm. and assess to what extent uh, you know, the issues are liquidity or solvency issues. And only when we actually do this, we're able to have the dependent institutions of the Eurozone, the ECB is able to come in and provide liquidity, but only once this agency problem that dominates the Eurozone is uh, fully addressed. So in that sense, this crisis is similar to other financial crises before, and it's similar to the ones that are coming our way, which are many. Uh, we're going to have a, a, you know, a lot of fun in the years to come uh, solving these problems. So I want to talk briefly about something that Kerr uh, also mentioned, which is whether rules can fix this problem. This is an old debate in economics, whether we should use rules or discretion to tackle uh, particular events uh, in, in, in economic fluctuations. And, uh, you know, rules by your commitment, they provide certainty, uh, those type of things. But the problem is that we live in a very non-stationary world, world where the moment you have to impose a particular regulation in place, actors who are more flexible than ever, who have more opportunities for deploy capital in different jurisdictions, will arbitrage the difference, accumulate risks uh, in different places. And because we lack a global governance uh, for bank resolution, essentially uh, create a massive, a massive externality across uh, the financial system. That is yet uh, you know, something to be resolved. We don't have uh, you know, much in terms of, of, uh, of solution uh, for this. I want to close with a couple of things, and I, of course, we want to leave as much time as possible for questions. I think one thing it, you know, that we have to remember is there were problems, I mean, an important thing to understand is how we got to a particular crisis. You know, the dynamics of risk accumulation are important to understand because they create constraints on how the crisis is going to be resolved. And Adam is fond of reiterating in the book that uh, the peaks, uh, Portugal, Ireland, Italy, Greece, and Spain, didn't uh, go on a public debt binge uh, prior uh, to the crisis. You know, it's a beautiful line. It bears repeating that Greece had no use Eurozone membership to go on an outside foreign binge, and this is absolutely true. Um, but the problem is that the scenes of all of us in the periphery, from, from the periphery, from the Spaniard, were more of a mission yeah. than of commission. Okay? And in particular, what is interesting about the Euro is that as the Euro establishment saw monetary union was as a commitment technology to actually tackle structural reforms that were very difficult to uh, address in isolation, effectively, okay? And what is fantastic about the Euro is that it coincided with a global credit cycle that completely uh, relaxed the incentives to actually tackle, uh, uh, you know, those structural reforms. The only country that did not suffer or did not benefit from these uh, easy global credit conditions you know, underwent severe structural reforms, and that country, of course, was Germany. Mm -hmm. Germany was the country that couldn't benefit from those easy credit conditions because effectively it was already that. Mm -hmm. So it was not that anybody constrained relax for Germany, and uh, on account of that, enter the crisis with the type of institutions in labor markets, pension markets, uh, in unemployment insurance, that all of us were called uh, to address. Finally, 
you know, the issue of, uh, you know, for instance, Eurozone reform, which is important to understand. One of the things that, and we're going to go through this now with Italy, one of the things to understand is that there was an additional challenge in Europe that creates, that is an issue of political power, political incentives. Effectively, think about it the following way. It is very difficult to enter into an insurance arrangement with someone you know is already sick. Okay, that's actually very difficult to do. That's effectively what we were trying to do in the first two years of the Eurozone crisis. We were trying to deepen the <coughs> discussions of the Eurozone without having addressed the legacy problems in countries such as Ireland, Greece, or Spain. It is only when these legacy problems are addressed that you can start thinking, okay, now that I know everybody's more or less healthy, now I can enter into an insurance arrangement. The only country that didn't do this, for reasons that we can discuss, is Italy. And that's why Italy is now the point of friction in the reform of the video. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you, John. So this is a real treat uh, and uh, a wonderful book. And I, I have to say that unlike my my responsible and assiduous uh, colleagues, I did not spend the last week uh, reading the book. I, I had read it. Um, <laughs> but I did instead, uh, um, I don't recommend this as an alternative, but as a supplement, uh, I, I did spend some time reading Adam's blog, <laughs> and, uh, which is much more compressed. And, and uh, the reason I uh, was drawn to the blog is uh, because the, uh, in the blog, and unless I'm mistaken, which I may well be, uh, Adam is, is working out uh, the theoretical uh, conceptions that underpin the book uh, and the political conceptions uh, to which the book points. Now, now uh, uh, the pragmatists of money will not be surprised to hear that people only uh, discover the theoretical import of what they're doing after they're almost done doing it. Uh, but such, such does seem to be the case, uh, and admirably so, in the book, in the, in the blog. And so what I, I want to do, Adam, Adam's remarks actually were, I would say, more blog than book, or blog bookish. They were on, but I, I want to uh, pick up uh, the central theme that he introduced, uh, which kind of also I mentioned, and uh, of uh, the, the shifting in the perception of macroeconomics. Uh, and I want to draw out some of the implications of that for uh, the ideas of, of causality that underline, uh, I think, Adam's body of work, not, not, just, not just crash, uh, and, 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 and point to some of the immediate regulatory and, uh, and political challenges that it, that it poses. I'll, I'll be very brief. So the idea, as he, as he signaled, uh, captured in some of this macro prudential writing, uh, is is a shift from from to put it very simply from the uh, island view of, of economies of national economies to a, 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 the network view that you all have in mind. But I want to be more precise because in 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 the blog you actually are more precise, but with with ambiguities that I'll unfairly resolve in favor of my own understanding of this. <laughs> so, so I, I think that the network of, uh, view uh, uh, has, has the following elements. Uh, first, that there is a globalization of production, uh, global value chains and big corporations dominating production. There's globalization of finance with big financial institutions that seek profit and, and can uh, have an independent effect on the real economy, not just reflect of the real economy, uh, but 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 uh, uh, un unlike the idea that, that uh, the story ends there, and that this is really just a story about the clash of, of, oligopol of, of oligopolists, which I I don't we'll, we'll see if you mean it or not. I, I I don't think you you fully mean it, though it's, it, it comports with some of, of what you say. But unlike that view, uh, in, in the view in your blog, and certainly in the view of the books, uh, there's entanglement, things that happen at the global level, uh, transmitted through these global networks, influence local things, but local things as much influence have, have deep effects on uh, uh, the global networks. And moreover, uh, at neither level, either at the global level nor the local level, is there a single extensive form of causality which explains what's going on. So that you have a very strange mixture of uh, different kinds of structural constraint operating at the local level and through the global network, 
Uh, and that is, that's a, it's a, a, a quite a striking idea of, of the causality of the crisis, but it's a much more general conception. Now, uh, uh, there are two, there are, are, I want to give two, two manifestations. One is, is the one that you, you pointed to, which is uh, the growth of, of uh, macro prudential regulation, which <coughs> acknowledges all this and says, in order to understand the basis of the liquidity crisis of, of an economy, you must actually understand the deep liquidity mechanisms of individual firms. <laughs> so the micro and the macro collapse, and you need some, we'll come back to that, but, but that's a clear manifestation of exactly this kind of local causality, right? That if you didn't need to know that, you would just know about banking in general in a certain epoch and so on. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, uh, is that this uh, strange causality uh, brings to mind a trope. There are many that it brings to mind, but there's a, one trope in particular that floats through the social sciences, a very idea, a strange idea of causality called combined and uneven development, mm -hmm. uh, which was uh, Trotsky's completely unintelligible idea for just saying, well, it isn't really Marxism because, you know, there are some, it's not teleological, it's not homogeneous, uh, but it certainly isn't just uh, uh, the clash of interests. There's a combination of structure, uh, perturbation, uh, which he just, to which he just gave that name, and which I think is intelligibly understood in the light of the, your characterization of, of causality. Now, uh, is this new or is this old? Well, in one sense, it's very old because, it, as you said, the, this idea of the, the financialization of the international financialization and the causality related to it uh, is goes back to, to the beginning of at least the 20th century and. It's a story that you've told masterfully. And not incidentally, uh, uh, Del Huge at the, is framed at the very beginning, three or four pages in and at the end, with the idea of combined and uneven development. So, so you've had this idea in the back of your mind. If that, that appears only once at the very end of the crash. Then, then you can search internally quickly. So, uh, so that's, in that sense, this is old. But in another sense, in a sense that you evoke, it's radically new because it, it, it means the crashing end of a set of categories, regulatory, legal categories, uh, by which we governed ourselves and by which, as you correctly say, power was exerted. And there is no question that that old world is, that, 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 that island conception is no longer tenable and this is a key element. People understand that it's no longer tenable. That, that's a, that is really a remarkable development. Now, uh, and here is where the, the challenges come. Uh, first, although every, it's understood by people who are close to inside the system or close to them, that, that can, the old conception is no longer tenable, there is no agreement whatsoever on what really is tenable. <laughs> and positions range, uh, understandably, from Katerina's pessimism about the possibility of doing anything that won't be rooted by the actors, uh, to the idea that the very desperation of the actors will be the thing that, as in many other crises in the past, opens opens up a political space which, at the moment, seems seems foreclosed. So we we don't know about that, but that's that's plainly on the agenda. I think that's a central thing in the book puts on the agenda, uh, and, and uh, uh, like these abusing crises to come, it won't go away. Uh, the second thing is political, uh, because I think you, you concluded with that, and, and uh, passionately so, and I share your passion. Uh, uh, there is uh, a fortiori, we don't know how to regulate this in a legal sense, right? and, and the surrounding institutions. We certainly do not know how to domesticate it democratically. And remember that the domestication now has to be macro-prudential yeah. in the sense that it is both national and global without the impossibility of a global state. We have all over, if you look in the trading system, there are 
there are elements that flash in and out of this of, of, a, of a system of regulation more or less accountable that that could serve this purpose. And here one one last one last remark. Uh, in your very last blog post, because I I I'm not interested in that. You know, that, that can happen when you're somebody is uh, doing fascinating work. You get fascinated. So in your very last blog post is about Keynes. Yeah. And and uh, it's about uh, about a Keynes that will be unfamiliar to many of you. It's it's uh, the Keynes of the Essays of Persuasion. Essays of Persuasion. And it's Keynes as a kind of Machiavellian uh, trying to understand how to reconcile technocracy and democracy. And capitalism. And capitalism. Mm -hmm. And and the uh, and Adams in this blog the. Adam teeters between the view uh, expressed at the beginning uh, that, that uh, maybe Keynes, somewhere in Keynes, there's an answer to this question, and the view that you might assume from all the preceding blogs and the reflection that it triggers, that what you discover is the very limit of the idea of a national technocratic solution. And now the opening up that is required for macro prudential mm -hmm. regulation we must also hope creates new possibilities for openness and democracy. Oh. <laughs> you can see why I was excited about this panel, and you can also see why I asked Mark to have a little bit of time to reply to the comment before we threw it open, because it's just so rich and and uh, uh, and fascinating. Um, so uh, let me. Um, let me, let me just work backwards and maybe just fill out, make sure everyone's on the same page about some of the, some of the terms that are being thrown around here. Um, the island model and the network model. So the island model is thinking about the global economy as though it consisted of an archipelago of national economies, which then trade with each other coconuts for bananas. And then we think of the global economy as being organized as coconut dealers and banana buyers and uh, then we spiral out, we have orange groves and so on, and this is the sort of classical vision. You can complicate that, obviously people can have different mixes of those things. But you start with national islands which trade commodities which you identify with countries. And this is basically how national economic accounting, national income accounting represents national entities. And what uh, 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 Hyoshan Shin uh, at the BIS has suggested in this rather ominous phrase that in fact the world economy is dominated not by little islands trading bananas and, and coconuts, but the interlocking matrix of corporate balance sheets. So that would be the banana trader and the coconut trader, not viewed as islands, but everything that goes on inside their businesses meshed with each other. And that is how we have to think of the world economy now. When you think of it that way, you think, well, there's thousands, millions of firms. That's impossibly complex. But it turns out that only 30 banks matter. <laughs> so at that stage, this is just crude simplification, but literally we have a list, and they're called globally systemically important financial institutions, GCP or GCIB, and then there's a, a similar list at each national level. And if you look at their balance sheets, and the way in which they interlock, you get the vast majority of a certain sort of financial activity. It's the bank balance sheet based bit. And so the proposal is that, the, and the break that we're suffering, is that we need to move from looking at the world economy as though it was a bunch of islands, to looking at it as though it was the interlocking of these balance sheets. And that um, is indeed, in some odd sense, a return to late 19th, early 20th century imperialism theory of the type that people like Lenin uh, and Hobson developed. But, and what I'm arguing is that in this kind of ellipse of the intervening period, for reasons which have to do with dem democratization and social democracy and the New Deal and the management of capitalism under democratic conditions, we put in between the island model. Because in so many ways, if we think of ourselves as all on a jolly island and sharing the proceeds from banana sales and then trading for coconuts, which we all want, this is a much easier political model of thinking about how the economy works. And what we have to face now is a return to a much more naked uh, vision of how the economy functions. And this is not 
simply a political move. It's, polit it's forced on us functionally by the collapse, the kind of mechanism that Tarnot was talking about. In other words, it's forced on us by the way in which these global market works, and the risks in 2008 were in the balance sheets of those top 30 to 100 types of banks, and then within the Eurozone, they were played out again within the balance sheets of the cross-national banks within the Eurozone, and then some local bites like the Capas in, in Spain. And then to take up the key point um, that Katerina made, those balance sheets are kind of amorphous and spread geographically. Uh, and, uh, but one of the two centres between which the financial ones are constitutively spread since the 1960s are absolutely the City of London and uh, Wall Street. And that is where all of the global financial action is, between the balance sheet of Lehman in Wall Street and the balance sheet of Lehman in London, and the way that relates to the balance sheet of J.P. Morgan uh, or, or Morgan Stanley or Barclays or Deutsche Bank. Into the and then and then up to the central banks. And so what so Tano was describing is the Fed registering from 2007 onwards that the local New York branches of all sorts of European banks were having a huge problem getting hold of the dollar funding they needed to match the mismatch in their balance sheets where they were loaded up with uh, uh, Eurozone funding, which no longer could be translated squarely into dollars, and so they were taking money from the New York Fed as the intermediary. And I would completely grant Katerina that those are the two nodes, but of course the players in London and Wall Street are much more motley. They are British. I mean, as Mervyn King famously commented about the city of London, it's like Wimbledon. Yeah. Very, very occasionally a British person wins. Uh, that's not what you go for. You go for the global party hosted on a beautiful English lawn. And that's what, that's what the city of London is, right? It's not a... And, and it's a party that, of course, is absolutely, and I have just little lines, because I know your work and appreciate it, now these little lines saying, like, and it's the law that does it. Evidently, the, the facility of New York law and English law enables that as a key element. And then everyone comes to play on those terms. But it really is everyone, and the European banks were knee-deep in this. It's certainly to, you know, to, to every bit as much as the British banks in particular. So when we say the city of London and Wall Street, we should really not be thinking in national categories at all. We should just be thinking on a big corporate playground. Um, so let me let me just let me just wrap this up by by uh, to one one insubstantial point and then um, some more uh, substantial points. So the insubstantial point is that I didn't pick the title. So, uh, the, the, the way that this works is that. They have an idea of what the book's about. It was supposed to be called Sudden Stop. And then they designed a cover and recognized that Sudden Stop didn't look good on the cover, literally. So then the hunt was on for a one-word thing that would look good on the cover. That's how the title comes up. So obviously, yes, you're absolutely right. The financial system didn't crash. And what's astonishing about this episode is, in a sense, it's like the Cuban Missile Crisis. We saw over the edge, we saw the end of the world, and then we pulled back. But I would strongly agree with you that the thing that really did break uh, is the political anchoring of this system, and this comes directly on to Chuck's point as well. But I would argue it broke on both sides. I mean, certainly the social democratic, the Tony Blair, Bill Clinton, uh, Gerhard Schröder vision broke, uh, which was squaring a globalist, neoliberal, for want of a better word, economic policy with its old blue-collar base, basically on the premise that the blue-collar voters had nowhere else to go to. So they would stick with the parties, whatever they did. I mean, what we're witnessing now uh, in the United States, above all, and uh, in America as well, is the fracturing of that deal on the right-hand side. Uh, and you could see that in the Republican Party already in the summer of 2008, because, I mean, in the middle of that crisis, as Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were going down with a Republican presidency in the middle of an election season, they couldn't whip the Republican votes behind the bailout of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac or TARP. Uh, you know, if you need a clearer signal of that compromise breaking down, that goes back at least as far as NAFTA, where you can see the elites of both parties converging on a deal which marginalised both of their bases to an extent. Um, so we would agree that is the bit that really breaks. But no, I mean, and totally the the points that, that Chuck made, so his, his interpretation is entirely correct. I would I would claim that the the ideas that in the blog were just waiting to be in the blog. Um, though, I, though I like my pragmatism as much as you do, so I'm perfectly happy to concede that it's in the doing that you think. Um, but this is indeed the crucial political question. What do we do uh, with the nakedness of this new macro-credential paradigm? What do we do with the nakedness of this vision of the economy um, as an interlocking network of corporate balance sheets? 
Um, because in that ellipse in between, a vision, a conception of the economy, um, a technical mechanism for managing it, and the politics, and indeed an international politics in the form of the New, uh, the New Deal, Marshall Plan, and Bretton Woods, went hand in hand. There was a logically, politically persuasive narrative that you could spin because we were going to manage the national cake. And once we'd managed the national cake and grown it and prevented recessions, we could then distribute the national cake better. You could postpone distributional arguments until you'd grown the national cake. There was an entire logic of political economic management that linked organically to national political entities and could be translated into policy. And what we've got right now, I think, is a is a sort of uh, an indeterminate expertise, the politics of which are very unclear, um, which terrifies conservatives because it's very, very intrusive if taken seriously. And if they do not gain it, as Katerina suggests, the macro and prudential stuff, you can know things about banks now you wouldn't have dreamt of knowing 15 years ago. And it's official kind of knowledge. But on the other hand, of course, it's also the product of in the crisis of 08, utterly incestuous, nakedly oligarchic uh, deals which stabilized the system. Um, the October 13th meeting in the Treasury uh, in 2008 cannot be outdone, I think. And one is forced, I think, back into classic Marxian categories. This is the executive committee of the American bourgeoisie doing its thing. If not, then never. Like, but that has got to be the test. Um, and, 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 and it is indeed uh, uh, very, very open. Or what we do, what we do with this knowledge, how, or what purposes it could be served, what political project it could be harnessed to, I think, is the open question. Keynes came back to me as an inspiration, and the Keynes of the essays of persuasion, which is not the Keynes of the general theory, so not the macroeconomist theorist of the 1930s, but the brilliant. Uh, political essayist of the 1920s thinking about the aftermath of Versailles and rethinking his critique of the peacemakers at Versailles, actually quite a uh, concession on his part, thinking for the first time, I think, in the 20s about how mass democracy, capitalism and expertise can really be made to go together in the way that he imagines. And that is inspiring for me, um, even if we leave the macroeconomics behind. Uh, that project and that, that theorization of, of the technocratic in relation to the democratic and the capitalist remains, I think, uh, profoundly challenging and interesting. So, but thank you so much for, for following up the, following up on the blog. I really appreciate it. <laughs> so I think uh, we can open things up. Uh, I'll, I'll you raise your hand, I'll take some questions. If you just identify yourself and then ask a brief question. Hi, um, I'm Mel Corey. Hi. Uh, how are you? Um, it's interesting that in this book, I haven't read the book, sorry. Uh, but in the conversation so far, the one word that hasn't come up is uh, housing. Housing, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Was the, uh, so yeah. I'm kind of old-fashioned, uh, so I look at this crisis a little bit like the tulip uh, situation, which is, you know, in the, uh, you had in the 70s oil, yeah. in the 80s you had the M&A bubble, in the 90s you had the dot-coms, and in the uh, 2000s you had, uh, you had housing. I'm just wondering if uh, sort of this, uh, classic approach to, uh, to uh, interpretation of uh, financial chaos uh, goes within the, uh, what, what you're discussing. And then my second point is, uh, I will have a full disclosure, uh, Tano is my brother-in-law. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, and Tano mentioned the sort of, a, you know, how well things went on in the US, the financial uh, response, and in the Eurozone somewhat more, uh, bumpy. Uh, but in the US you did have stragglers and that's beneath the federal level. Yes. You have the state and the municipalities. I mean you have situation where you have Detroit, Stockton, etc. going into bankruptcy and I think the effects of that are very much what we're seeing today. Excellent. Economics clearly runs in your extended family. <laughs> <laughs> Those are great questions. I just responded well, straight away to those. Yeah, I mean, one of the effects of this particular narrative is to decenter housing. Um, because, uh, and this has been a move you've seen Bernanke making in the last couple of weeks as well, right? Because it's not so much that housing becomes a trigger, but the thing that we're focusing on as the driver of the panic in 2008, also with massive real economic effects, is the liquidity crunches, the global bank run. And, and that can be triggered by virtually anything. Um, but if housing uh, has 
is non-incidental because unlike tulips, and I would resist the tulip analogy, because housing really matters. I mean, American real estate on one estimate is something like 12, 20% of global marketable wealth. American real estate alone, that's all real estate, not just domestic real estate. That may be a slight overstatement because it saddles the global real estate broker, which makes this case. But nevertheless, it would be surprising if it was less than 15% of global marketable wealth. So if that asset inflates and you build a mechanism for inflating that asset, you basically build a global inflationary mechanism. And if you, as Katerina was saying, create a way of turning that by these securitization mechanisms into this extraordinary fungible resource, you, you have created a, a kind of a doomsday machine in terms of financial instability. And the very biggest crises, generally speaking, do have this logic of the harnessing of financial engineering to housing. So, and that is also one of the mechanisms through which after the Americans do their excellent bank-centered crisis fighting mechanism, the crisis lingers on because the difference between a housing bust and a bank run is that a housing bust unfolds over a matter of years. No need to tell people from Spain that it, <laughs> fold, it runs all the way down to the present. Those, that negative equity sits on household balance sheets sometimes for a lifetime. Uh, and that has real economic effects over that kind of time horizon. A bank run operates, in extreme cases, in a matter of hours. So Lehman goes from being able to repo, that is, turn over the overnight funding, roughly $200 billion on its balance sheet, to not being able to repo anything in a matter of days. So that they are very different temporalities. And as much as one must give this incredibly concentrated power clique in the United States credit for having solved the bank run, because that's precisely the political structure you need to solve a bank run, get everyone that matters in the room and try and stabilize opinion quickly. The, 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 the um, rescue effort for American householders is, of course, very patchy, runs basically through macroeconomic variables, through quantitative easing and through the fiscal stimulus, and very little can be done at that level. And I would agree with you that... Um, you know, to compare, as it were, the federal government in the United States with the nitty-gritty of the Eurozone <laughs> is, a, is a very unequal comparison. If you go to the worst-hit American states and you look at the fiscal policy response in many of those, uh, it's devastating, and you see the pain of that, again, running through... It's, it's the driver of the teachers' strikes uh, that we saw in unlikely places across the United States um, earlier this year and last year, is that pain feeding it through this decentralized fiscal system, added, of course, with you know, the added ingredient of political entrepreneurship, but that's in the European formula too. So I would, I would wholeheartedly agree with you. Hi, my name is Laura Hick. I'm at actually a German student at the Columbia CETA School, and I studied in France before, so I'm kind yeah. of European. But um, more a future-looking question, and also from Germany. Um, mm. I'm in the midst of reading your book, uh, and Germany does not get a very good... <laughs> it's quite a... Well, I mean, it's the truth, probably, but uh, Germany, as you already said, or kind of the epistle as well, that Merkel was always the one vetoing everything and kind of preventing the further integration. So what do you think has to happen that Germany finally, in my opinion, goes forward to this greater fiscal integration and kind of just sets aside its very conservative monetary policy outlook. I mean, I was at pains, the book is critical of Germany, um, I was at pains not to write an anti-German diatribe. Um, <laughs> no, seriously, because, because this is important. Um, also because of my political purpose. Um, there is a live tradition of anti-German diatribes with regard to the Eurozone in New York uh, at this school. Um, and um, I, given that my aim really in political terms was to engender a debate transatlantically about the interconnectedness of this crisis, it would be fatal to that project if the book was just another one of those <coughs> few more stories about how this goes down. And it's basically Krugman Stiglitz who have sort of coined that particular type of critique of the Eurozone. And in many ways I sympathise with, with it, of course, because you know I'm a kind of progressive, liberal kind of person, but I think their politics on the Eurozone is unhelpful to that project, certainly my European conception. So what I tried to do instead was in fact give, you know, this book, though it's big, 
covers a lot of ground, so none of it's really a thick description, but I tried to provide at least an intelligible account of what motivates German policy. And my view of the Germans is they're not at all special, so this is not a reinvention of a Zondervig argument. The argument is basically they're the last adherents of the common sense of the 1990s. Yeah. Uh, and what they did was, and this I do think is fatal, uh, is to write that into their constitution with the debt break of 2009. And so to get themselves over the political hurdle of doing work creation, which they eventually did do in early 2009, the, grand, the great coalition as it then was, with Per Steinbrück as finance minister, signed up to this reorganization of the structure of German federal finance, which imposes on the lower levels of German government a zero debt rule and tightly constrains the borrowing of the federal authorities. And the lower levels of German government are big chunks, like nordrhein westfalen is probably twice the size of Greece in terms of population and maybe three or four times the size of Greece in terms of GDP. So having done that for nordrhein westfalen which is a post-industrial area with very serious local government finance problems, obviously the Germans were not in a big mood to compromise when it came to the laggards of you know, the, the southern periphery, because if it was good for nordrhein westfalen like Bremen, then it was going to be good for Greece too. And I don't think of that as a peculiar German kind of obsession with austerity. I just think they were writing a kind of tough version of Gordon Brown's golden rule uh, into the post-2009 period, in a period in, what, in which the system itself was calling for massive discretionary action. <coughs> so, <coughs> and they were writing a powerful non-discretionary mechanism into their policy apparatus. During the crisis itself, they let that slip, and the German deficit is as large as anyone else's. But they have, with remarkable persistence since then, reconverged on the debt road. I'm with a bunch of friendly journalists uh, in Germany launching a, you know, Vergangenheitsbewertung. So coming to terms with the past on the debt road. Uh, the anniversary is next May, and we're going to host an event in Berlin in which we're going to attempt to reconsider the debt road. And uh, the message is going to be a Kantian one, because we think Kant will work well with Germans. Um, and uh, th because the debt break was instituted out of fear of German democracy, because Germany had always had a fiscal rule which said that they could only borrow for investment, and they had since the 70s flagrantly abused that rule. And so Steinberg's argument was, so that democracy could regain its flexibility, it needed to discipline itself. Right? Now, they have done that. They have proven to the world that they can run surpluses, even under conditions in which people are throwing money at them to borrow. They have proven their, what Kant would call, Mündigkeit, right? Their adultness, their ability to be responsible. So their current condition is selbstverschuldete Unmündigkeit, the definition of a failure of enlightenment, self-imposed immaturity. That is what the debt break in its current form is. The Germans should credit themselves with having demonstrated that they can live within a fiscal rule and should now say that having done that, this is part of a learning process and they love those, 10 years on they can change the fiscal rule to enable investment, which is what the Eurozone and what Germany needs badly, um, is to open that up. And we're going to try and launch an initiative next year, and this will obviously be driving basically on the SPD, to say, look, Good, but we get it. It was a success. It was even necessary for a phase. But now we're in this state of self-imposed immaturity. Because basically it's a fear of democracy for which you are maintaining this rule. And that can't be good. So that's going to be the push. And that's, you know, that's an active program. People at the side are on board. We think we can probably get the DEB behind it. You know, we actually want to kind of mobilize a conversation precisely on those lines. And it isn't, you know, just a slam, uh, slamming the Germans or declaring, I think, as somebody that Ashoka Modi does, that given who the Germans are, there's really no hope for the Eurozone. It's a politics of actually trying to change that conversation from the inside. Yeah. Um, I did read your book, and I thought it was absolutely fantastic. Thank you. Um, but I wanted to ask you something. You mentioned it uh, just, just recently, um, that you view the crisis as being a liquidity crisis, and, and the way I read the book, it's not even a liquidity crisis on the asset side, it's on the dollar liability yeah. side. I'm just wondering how you can be so certain of that, because as Professor Santos was just mentioning, you have assets that are incredibly difficult to value. You had a capital system where some of these institutions could have leverage of 60 to 1, and how did anyone know at the time whether these institutions were or were insolvent, and what gave you the confidence to say that this was uh, liquidity 
crisis and not even the liquidity crisis on the asset side with these incredibly difficult to value assets but on the liability side. So this is where my this is where my historianness comes in as opposed to my economistness. So I do not have a counterfactual model which allows me to discriminate and to really answer your question. What I can tell you is that the thing that was going to kill the world economy by the second week of September 2008 was the liquidity crisis and the problem of the dollars. Were there other things that might have killed the world economy too? This is where an economist with the ability to actually fully model the situation would come in. And what I'm, what I'm saying is that it doesn't matter to all intents and purposes because unless they had fixed that first liquidity crisis, you don't, you don't get to second base. You're dead right there. So this is a patient who's got you know, a heart attack, a stroke, uh, you know, kidney disease, and the question is which one of these is going to kill you first? And in 2008, it looks like the heart attack will get you first, right? Um, and then, of course, and this is what Tano was also talking about, so then how do you respond to this? And in a sense, you never really want to find out about the solvency crisis. You know, declaring the solvency problem at Lehman was part of the disaster. It's once they declared it a solvency issue, they couldn't do anything. If they'd gone on pretending it was liquidity, they could probably have rescued it. If they had rescued it, they might, however, never have gotten to TARP. And the beauty of the TARP solution on the American side, and it can't be emphasized strongly enough, is that they solve the problem of collective action for a group of highly competitive capitalists, which goes to this question of who the actors are. You would expect somebody in that room on the 13th of October to flounce out saying, no, I don't need this money, there's no reason why I should take it, I'm going to stigmatize everyone who stays in this room. And we know, we know that that's what we should expect because that's what Deutsche Bank did in Germany at an equivalent meeting, and that's what Barclays and HSBC did in Britain at equivalent meetings there. The miracle of what happened at that moment is that the American state, represented, of course, by a former CEO of Goldman Sachs, so a funny, <laughs> a funny kind of mirroring that's going on here, is able to corral everyone and say, no, everyone's taking the capital. And everyone's taking the capital precisely so we never have to ask difficult questions about solvency of anyone in this room. Because we're going to give the weakest people here enough to get them through the next couple of weeks. And to cover their shame, we're going to give everyone in the room capital. And then we're going to hope this crisis just goes away. And if it were to be true that Citigroup and Bank of America, once it's absorbed, Beryl Lynch needs a little bit extra, well, that'll be later. But right now, no one leaves this room without taking so much that this question goes away, at least temporarily. And I think that's the... So we'll never know. I mean, you know, if they had not had that meeting and if they had run this experiment a little bit harsher with less we could have, we might well have discovered that there were, you know, any number. There's every reason to think there were all sorts of balance sheets that were dead. Citigroup should surely never really have survived this crisis in its form, right? But the whole point of the politics was not to run that experiment. The whole point of crisis fighting was to, to, to shut that question down. Can I add just one thing to this? Just very briefly. I, I agree with you, but eventually you need to figure it out. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, that's the, that was the role of the stress test, yes. which played a very important yeah. role in 2009 when yeah. any of it runs them. That plays a very important role. The failure of those stress tests in yeah. Europe plays a very important yeah. role in the dynamics of the Eurozone crisis. Yeah. And if you look at when the Spanish crisis starts getting solved, it's when we run a serious stress test in yeah. the fall of 2012. So, eventually you have to figure it out. But I agree with Adam, you know, there's a moment for liquidity and there's a moment for solvency. Mm -hmm. uh, but the crisis turn when you actually start tackling the solvency issues. If you leave solvency yeah. crisis unresolved, then morphed into liquidity crisis. So the stress tests are the tests they did in May 2009 where they actually run hypotheticals on the balance sheets of all the banks and go, how underwater would you be under the following really negative assumptions? And then if you fall below a certain level, you have to go and recapitalize in the market. You can't do it there. You have to take TARP funding. And this is an incredibly delicate exercise because it's supposed to build confidence. It's posing explicitly the solvency question under crisis conditions. And so you don't want to report very bad news. If, on the other hand, you report too good news, which is what the Europeans consistently do, you lose all credibility. And then so people start second guessing and they start guessing your good faith, which is not, bad, not good at all. But this also cuts directly to this question of the politics of macroprudential regulation. Because one of the truly remarkable things about the stress test is that going to the market to get extra capital is only one way you can rebuild your financial resilience. The other way is basically to retain profit. And so the stress test become a government oversight system over the profitability of America's banking system. And they are literally targeting, the Fed is running models on how much profit they expect each one of these individual American banks to accumulate. 
So at this point, we're really in the realm of like nuclear reactor regulation or something like that. You know, utility regulation. How much money does a gas supply company need to make to properly maintain the gas supply? We're not in the world really of competitive finance. And I pitched this at Geithner, who was at first really taken aback because he, you know, he understands this, but he couldn't remember the details. And it is quite shocking when you realize that the Fed and the Treasury are basically targeting the balance sheets of the private banks, and they're making sure they earn enough profit to be stable, because that's the implication of financial stability politics, is the entities need to earn enough profit to be stable, which is shocking. But the answer, in its own way, equally shocking, is so-called capital planning. So America's banks operated over this entire period, still do, but it's so loose now that no one cares, under rules which required regulatory permission before they could dispense dividends to shareholders. Now, that's an incredible intrusion. And you know, in the Cold War days, can you imagine them ever calling this capital plan? I mean, it, you know, it's like, you know, it's like some sort of Soviet conspiracy against American capitalism. You mean shareholders will only get paid if government officials say the bank has made enough profit, stashed it away in ways that they think are suitable? Yes, is the answer. And that is another huge difference between the European and the American banks, is that desperate as they became, the European banks just dispensed more and more dividend to keep their, pop their share prices up and strip themselves of the resources necessary to actually build resilient losses. Yeah, but that's what the American banks have done in the, in the months leading yep. up to Lehman's, right? They yep. had stripped themselves. Yeah, they, they, they had done, yeah. So they, they understood, and the American regulators are extremely clear about this dynamic and its significance for managing banks, but it is a remarkable, I mean, to go to Chuck's point, I mean, this shows how fungible these limits are all of a sudden becoming. I and mean, imagine a Corbyn government coming in and saying, you know, we'd kind of quite like to do that for a large slice of British business. You know, we'd like patient capital, we'd like you to retain profits. They just did it with this 1% a year. Yeah, exactly. It's exactly this, but, but this is, that's the zone that we were in, and yet it remains completely below the radar because in the stress test, they're technical. You need to you need to get inside them to figure out what they're about, and it's not called profit. It's called pre-provision net revenue. But there it is, and it's accounting for most of the financial strengthening. Uh, and so, you know, that for me is the promising aspect of this moment: is that those are the tools of regulation that are potentially extremely powerful. I'd like to move us back a little bit and ask you something about the first point you raised, which was the question of narrative. Mm. Uh, we've, been, we've been talking a lot about the details of the crisis, ways that we talk about it and so on. It seems to me that you have written three books in a quartet about the transatlantic relationship. Mm. Uh, uh, one starts with the deluge, uh, and one goes on to wages, and then there's a gap, <laughs> and then there's this. Uh, and you were talking about the difference between the island and the network model of thinking about economics. And it seems to me that um, the international historian in you uh, has a clear model for telling narratives of events like this uh, that, that has worked very well in the deluge and worked very well in wages. And national actors of one kind or another are uh, the main protagonists. Mm -hmm. Um, and now suddenly we come to 2008, 2009 and the aftermath and we're getting into the nitty gritty of how exactly to analyze this crisis. And you'd said that the old macroeconomics that provided the island framework no longer works. And yet from the genre point of view, one is reading a narrative uh, of national actors of different kinds. So I guess one way of formulating my question would be, is a narrative possible using the new macro financial economics? Yeah, Who is, would be the protagonist? Yeah. Or is yeah. there some source problem or ex job literary expectation yeah. problem? Um, seems to me on one hand we're saying we're in a new world. Yeah. And yet actually the literary form that we're all talking about reads to me very much like that. And this is this is such a good question. And it, it's implicit in what uh, Katerina was asking too. Um, um, and um, but, 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 but. Uh, the, the, it's, it's hard. I'm not going to say there's a simple answer. Uh, there's no doubt that at some level I've once again failed to write a business history, or in some senses even a conventional economic history. Um, and that's fundamentally because I am really interested in the politics. And the politics do recalcitrantly continue to reside at the level of various type of institutional actor, many of which are nation-state actors. 
and some of which are supranational in the form of the ECB and the EU project. Um, and above all, um, the dollar-based structure of the global financial system um, continues to mean that when things get rough, uh, the system pyramids down or pyramids up to the authorities of the United States. Um, and so I regard this moment not so much as the complete realization, if you like, of a world dominated by the interconnected matrix of private capital and balance sheets, but much more one characterized by an even and combined development, <laughs> in which there are certain sectors for which that's clearly true, and which may to that extent actually have moved beyond national regulation in an obvious sense. And so the deeply interconnected supply chains of various types of industry may already be in that state, hence the perplexity of Trumpian trade policy at this moment. It's just not quite sure how you really make sense of Apple's middle business model and the national premises anymore. But the extraordinary thing about the global, global financial system is that deeply integrated as it is, and important and dominant as those private actors are, given the reliance on the dollar, in the end it comes down to the dollar-based system um, and the American state institutions. And as we've seen in the Eurozone, when that kind of backstop at the macro-regional level, the level appropriate to the density of financial integration is not there, it's catastrophic. So um, that, for me, would be my, my, my answer to you, that yes, the book is in a sense on this side of this transition. If we think of this in teleological terms as a transition, this book is squarely still located on this side of that transition. It feels like, to that extent, and I say so, I think somewhere, the last 20th century crisis rather than the first 21st century crisis. Hence also this strange traditional geography in the Atlantic between the city of London and Wall Street. I mean, that's, that's old school. If you have a teleological view of you know, what our future is. Um, and so then the question really is where does China reside in this, in this sort of narrative? And to my mind, it's really ironic because if there's anything that warrants retaining the old mid-century, mid-20th century model of global inter economic interaction into the 21st century, um, it's China. Uh, because China operates an e that macroeconomic policy model that the Keynesians of the 1950s and 60s would have lusted over. They would have dreamed of it. This is perfect Keynesian fine tuning. You have this incredibly finely tuned set of macro and, and uh, fiscal and monetary policy instruments, no inhibitions about legislative process. You see unemployment dip up or dip down, you tweak the very, you tweak your mechanisms, you can go inside the balance sheets of the big Chinese banks and regulate how much credit they're issuing. I don't mean to draw a fantasy of Chinese technocracy, but you know, that is 1950s economic policy making. And that's what sits opposite the United States in the run up to the crisis. And it's one of the reasons why the Krugman Stiglitz uh, Peterson Institute type narrative still has purchase, because when you're dealing with China, you're dealing with a country with a foreign exchange reserve and foreign exchange controls. It's like 1950s international economics. Of course, on the American side, we're kind of halfway into the network balance sheet world. And on the transatlantic dimension, we're fully there. Um, and the world that we're in now, well, we don't know where we're going. Like one scenario is that China becomes, when we talk about China financially integrating with the world, is the that sounds good when we think about liberal constraints, non-discretionary limitations on the Chinese policy, but A, that strips them of their ability to do this magical macro intervention, which they're so good at, uh, and, and B, it means they do remain fundamentally isolated from us, and the political implications of that old story of how the, you know, China will be sucked into the liberal world and become a responsible stakeholder, those slip off into the future. On the other hand, it's almost equally alarming to imagine China's private sector getting sucked into the interlock, interlocking balance sheet world, because we saw how dangerous that was. We've already had a test run, and we saw it in 2015, because as many dollars as the Chinese public sector accumulates through the national trade surplus, this does not in any way limit the ability of the Chinese private sector to take advantage of incredibly cheap global dollar funding and to stash huge quantities of dollar liabilities on their private balance sheets. And then all of a sudden, China looks just like South Korea in 2008, mm -hmm. or Germany for that matter in 2008, which looks healthy from the point of view of national macro, safe as houses you'd think, but whose private sector has got these huge liabilities on it in another currency. 
And that's what we saw in 2015. In 2015, the China, there, was a, there was a panic, full blown panic in China. The Shanghai stock market was collapsing. The yuan was going down, not up. American interest rates were going up, not down. So all of a sudden, all those carry trade deals where you borrow dollars, the yuan appreciates, the American interest rates lower than the Chinese interest rate, and you get rich, they all go into reverse. And when everyone knows they're going into reverse, you get a potential for a landslide of the unwinding of these unbalanced balance sheets. And it was, it was terrifying in 2015. We really underestimate the element of uncertainty as we head into the American presidential election in 2016. And a big part of that is this global shock through the emerging markets in 2014 and then hitting China at that moment. And there were two things that enabled us to get through that. One is, well, three. Chinese held their nerves. They identified that this was a private sector balance sheet problem. They thought it was about a trillion dollars, and they were right. They burned their reserves down by a trillion dollars. Then they amplified foreign exchange controls, which is a huge issue of domestic politics because the Xi has to square this with the oligarchs who are the people who are actually running the money out. Uh, but they managed to do that. And the third absolutely key element is that uh, Janet Yellen's Fed abstains from further raising American interest rates in September 2015 and does so explicitly conditioning American economic policy on the situation in China. Now, that to me is the kind of half world that we might be entering into. And you know, what narrative form will be appropriate for that will presumably be some sort of hodgepodge of a private sector-based story with an American national actor, which isn't really an American national actor in the Fed, and the Chinese being a classic mid-20th century national actor. And I think we have to encompass all three of those realities um, uh, at the current moment. And it's a very you know, uh, unstable and heterogeneous mixture. A national central bank that's actually acting globally, a power state that's doing a mid-20th century thing, and an unfettered globalization, all side by side. Uh, uh, you know, it's, a, it's, it's, a pretty, it's, a, it's certainly not the, the Bretton Woods uh, world. <laughs> Uh, to pursue that point about the uh, governance of the global balance sheets, I'm struck, I'm clearly, Professor Pistor is absolutely right about the role of English and New York law, but you didn't address Basel III and the other uh, reg strictly regulatory concepts. Similarly, Professor Santos said something about resolution, but there is, what will work is to be determined, but there is a substantial body of resolution work both in this country at the OLA and the equivalent in Europe. So if you could talk about those um, sort of applications, I think, of what uh, Professor Tews was just talking about. Uh, it's, uh, they're, they're traditionally sort of uh, disdained by both the left and the right, but they have actually, I think, had very substantial effects on the, the 30 big banks. Yeah. Uh, re resolvability is a huge issue that the banks have to address, etc. Yeah. So, so I did not talk much about regulation because I think this is this is typically the reaction to a particular crisis, and of course, all the basal um, incarnations were reactions to a particular configuration of the global financial system. They do have some bite, I would say, temporarily. Uh, typically, the private sector also knows how to get around those again, well, and if only. Well, the has endorsed it. <laughs> yes. Okay. Well, I mean, yes, but I think, yes, but I, I, I think it's it's really a matter of time. So I, I think also some of the activities are shifting just around the banks to some other financial intermediaries. So I, I don't want to play this down completely, but these are important developments. On resolution, you know, I think we still don't have a global resolution mechanism. So within the eurozone, we get a single resolution mechanism. Everything else is just to find some harmonization of basic principles so we have some idea what might be happening that might be happening. But one of the things since 1974, since the demise of National mm -hmm. Bank, um, we've been talking about um, a resolution regime. We don't have one because in you know bankruptcy is always the asset test. That's when we have to allocate losses. And if you design a bankruptcy regime you're basically anticipating who will have to bear the losses. And this is what the politicians are absolutely incapable of doing. So I, I just don't see this coming. It's absolutely necessary um, but um, um, and I think in the Eurozone, we, we, you know, this was through the banking union, was forged, but we finally have that, but I don't see this happening at the global level, really. Uh, on Her sorry, on Herstatt, there are, there's a mechanical solution that I think is largely there, in that you can no longer have the gap. Mm -hmm. So there, there are technical solutions. Sure, some, some of them. Are. Can, I, can I just take up this point, it was just that question that Tano raised. I mean, I think the question of, like, could it be regulated by law is maybe one sentence at the very... The, the very end, yes, yeah, just one sentence in passing. So, um, 
and and Taylor said, you know, could this could this could rules solve the problem? Is the question posed, and I and I would I would take the answer to be evidently not, and indeed even thinking in terms of rules as anything more than a temporary expedient is is one way to be blindsided. Uh, what it seems to me that we need, and it's difficult to know how to do this, but this should surely be the challenge, is to equip regulators with the same kind of vision of the people that they're regulating. In other words, that there is a sort of moving frontier of opportunities and challenges and opportunities for profit in the case of the of the businesses, and, and we should formulate some function that incentivizes regulators equivalently. Um, because capitalism is a process of creative destruction. It's not agriculture. Uh, you know, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's, I mean, agriculture may be even understating how, you know, it's the, the vision that, say, ordo liberal, neoliberals have of economic regulation is so static. It's a question of finding an order that will somehow last, and then they're surprised that it gets blown away every decade. We should have the reverse attitude. I mean, this is such a fast-moving frontier, constantly intersecting with tech and everything else, that it has to be regulated at that kind of pace. So, of course, the question there is how do you do something that isn't basically just endless politicized discretion, which is then, of course, open to, to capture. But that's where the political problem comes is. That is the political challenge, that we, we cannot afford ever to go to sleep on this thing at any point. Uh, um, because the other side of the game, of course, doesn't. They're massively incentivized to constantly churn, undermine any regulations that you pass and find new ways for making profit. But can I just say, ask you the menu one question? I think, you know, the issue of discretionary intervention, particularly prior to the crisis when risks are being accumulated, is one that I think we should devote more time to, to understand. Yes. Yes. Because, I mean, one of the things that is striking, for instance, Krugman is, you know, spoken often about the Spanish yeah. banking crisis, saying that nobody was aware of yeah. the Spanish real estate bubble. Everybody in Spain was aware of the Spanish <laughs> real estate bubble. It was and massive. You talked about, <laughs> you talked about it in 2003, and you could not be in Spain without talking about the real estate bubble. <laughs> and the interesting thing is that everybody knew about it, the policymakers yeah. knew about it, um, the press was aware of it, and nothing it's got done. done. The political economy of this is, 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 is really treacherous. Yeah. Uh, so I'm pessimistic about our ability to control the process of risk accumulation. And to this point, that Catalina was bringing at the very beginning, that you regulate this. Uh, you know, I teach my students how the balance sheet of Apple looks like now. Apple is now one of the largest banks in the world. It has $220 billion of funding there provided to the market through asset back, commercial paper, you name it. Everything is there, mortgages, you name it. And this is going to get bigger. And, uh, Going back to what you were saying, our institutional framework, for instance, to provide liquidity in a liquidity crisis, is not set up to get liquidity to those agents. It's set up to provide liquidity to banks mm -hmm. and primary dealers, but not to funds. We don't have a mechanism to actually do this. Can I, can I feed up on that? This, this, for me, is also one of the reasons why I've taken to writing blogs, because the book form is not very well appropriate. Is not very appropriate. I mean, if one takes seriously what we're talking about, right. the demands of this kind of engagement and analysis, you know, are not, this is a very clumsy, unhelpful very way, static, of, yeah. very static, right? Now, I'm not going to deny that there's a real value in at least once trying to right. capture it in a narrative like this and tying things together. But that's why, you know, the, the sort of, for me, it's a combination of reading the financial analysts and reading Lenin. Um, uh, Renin for Deluge, you know, who is the best blogger that's ever lived. I mean, if you read Lenin, uh, in, in, you know, he writes daily, he publishes daily, and it is this relentless insistence on practical engagement with a world that he takes to be totally dynamic, you know, and lethal in its implications. And that, that for me, is why the, the blog form has become extremely attractive, because it, it enables precisely that kind of flexible, moving uh, response, which, which, as Mark is suggesting, is in some ways, a, you know, well, it's the, the formal, it's the formal, of, the formally appropriate. Mm -hmm. Wait, let, let me uh, just say one, uh, an optimistic thing. <laughs> uh, um, uh, and, and not at all to discourage your, your blogging, uh, which I'm all, all the more to encourage you. But, the optimistic thing is, is this, that um, uh, the situation that's described, uh, the series of conditions, the uh, uh, constant innovation uh, in the face of 
uh, uncertainty, innovation contributing to uncertainty, uh, and with the concomitant possibilities for evading regulatory uh, structures, is not exceptional to finance. No. It's ubiquitous. It's and, and uh, you know, because it's ubiquitous and because it is set in, in earlier in some places than in finance, there are, uh, there, there are quite robust, uh, I'll, I'll say it's an oxymoronic, robustly emergent <laughs> solutions. I mean, that is, they have stood the test of time, they're consolidating in a, in a number of areas. I mean, I won't, I won't go through the list, but it's, it's, it really is not the case. It is really not the case that uh, the, the discovery here is not that the world is ruled by finance, but that finance is as bad as everything else. <laughs> that's, that's the, that really, I, 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 I don't think that finance is singular. I think that the impetus is to understand finance as a part of the warp and web of, yeah. of this new system. And for that reason, I, I think Mark is, is right, that this, uh, what you're calling a hodgepodge, mm -hmm. I, I, I think that there is nothing over the horizon but more hodgepodge. Yeah, that's okay. And, and, and that the, in that sense, the narrative form, uh, <coughs> because I, I myself, uh, when, you, when you have, if you ask yourself what the narrative of, uh, 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 in, entangled balance sheet is. It's a network sociology, yes. which is one of the most dead subjects on yes. earth. <laughs> uh, so there is a there is a really I'm, yeah. I'm quite serious. Uh -huh. I mean that, that's the the kind of rigorous investigation of the, yeah. that kind of entanglement. And I think what you are what you have helped us all understand uh, is is this uh, politically explosive hodgepodge. Uh, I know there are many other questions, but it's not only a crisis that kind of scares. I draw this to a close and suggest that we continue the questions and answers informally afterwards next door. And hope you'll join me in thanking Adam, Tudors, and the family for